uh, in his wisdom, Dr. Rosenberg pushed the envelope, I think, a little bit in, on our thinking, certainly mine, and to force, as I mentioned earlier, to force a, a lot of thinking and to distill into a 10-minute talk uh, is uh, an interesting experience. Uh, so I picked a couple of areas to talk about in terms of uh, um, where the forefront seem to be relating to in, uh, infectious diseases in, uh, and immunology in, uh, in our disorder. Uh, first part, of course, is a little bit more established, and that's the idea of antimicrobial prophylaxis. And uh, in group A strep, and just talk about standard recommendations. Uh, there's some information on group A streptococcal vaccines, which could be major in terms of preventing this disease if we can decrease the total amount of streptococcus in the community uh, in the future. Whether this would have value for people who already have uh, PANS or PANDAS remains to be seen. And then finally, the holy grail would be to invent a way to actually reverse the autoimmune process. And the um, good news there is that there's at least some uh, movement in that direction. So I'll talk about these three things. Um, so, as we've already mentioned many times, um, the idea of preventing uh, streptococcal infections has a precedent in preventing rheumatic fever, and it's long established that penicillin can do that. Um, doing it proactively uh, is important because many acquisitions, as you know all very well, um, can result in uh, immune responses and flare-ups even in the absence of a sore throat. So just waiting for a sore throat was long uh, considered not to be the way to go with preventing rheumatic fever, and certainly that's true with, uh, with uh, pandas as well. And here's just the standard recommendations for prevention of rheumatic fever that we rely on and will also and also adapt to some extent to the management of pandas. So pen, pen, the actual treatment of choice that has been the best shown to be the most effective is actually injection of long-acting penicillin once a month. Um, and so that's listed first by the um, uh, American Thoracic Society, American Academy of Pediatrics, and so on, as the treatment of choice to prevent rheumatic fever. And so that actually can, it can be considered an option in our patients as well. Uh, most of the time we do not do that and go instead with uh, penicillin or one of the other antibiotics that has anti-streptococcal activity. And interestingly enough, the standard recommendation for rheumatic fever for the third choice for people with penicillin allergies is sulfadiazine, which doesn't kill strep very well at all, but does seem to prevent uh, active infections. Uh, whoops. How do I go backwards? Um, uh, and if no, neither of those drugs can be given according to this old-time standard recommendation, then macrolide or azolide is listed, but there's no details given because there's no research to support the exact recommendation, so it's just called variable uh, utilization of those drugs. And then I've added, uh, as we mentioned earlier in the question and answer, that uh, the cephalosporins have great activity against uh, group A streptococcus in human beings, and uh, so that's on my list of potential drugs, and we do actually use those. Um, quite a bit. Um, so to adapt rheumatic, so the, 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 I'm trying to look at this from the point of view of an outsider or a non-believer about all of this, and so the, their concern will be um, that the connection between strep and our disease is not nearly as tight as it is for rheumatic fever, in which that connection is very tight. Um, and so we know many of our kids with PANS have the same syndrome, basically, without the streptococcal story, whereas that's not true with rheumatic fever. So that gives uh, a little, uh, it weakens our case a little bit. Uh, the idea of doing the research of doing, using antibiotics versus no antibiotics would be the controlled study that would be required to answer this question of really what do antibiotics do or don't do in a scientific way um, would be very hard to do at this point from all of the things that we've all experienced and we know and we've talked about over and over again in this conference. Uh, so that's going to be a difficult issue uh, in, in making our case. Uh, other issues are what antibiotics should we use? Should we focus on strep? Should we focus more broadly? Should we develop a series of steps starting narrow and going wide, starting with penicillin and going ultimately to augment and say? Um, the first one targets strep, augment and targets the microbiome in my, a myriad of ways. And all of this needs to be sorted out and hopefully will be uh, the focus of uh, some of our collaborative research in the future. And then we've talked now many times about the interactions between microbiome, the normal bacteria we all live with. Uh, Tanya even just mentioned it in the last talk. And that too is an open area for um, pr prospective research as we've talked about quite a bit. Um, pr 
very exciting are the last two topics, even though uh, the answers aren't in yet. These are things that, uh, uh, that we can look forward to in the future. The first of these is um, the more advanced of the two, and that's the idea of actually having a vaccine to prevent streptococcal infection. That would certainly be one holy grail. Um, streptococcal infections, as you know, are so common. We've talked about that in, uh, today also. Um, and wouldn't it be nice to have a vaccine we could give routinely to all of our childhood population as they're growing up that would significantly reduce or even eliminate the whole problem of streptococcus? Um, it, the potential for that ob is obvious, the potential to prevent pandas from ever happening in the first place, especially if we could identify uh, at-risk families. Um, and then even, even if you're in your wildest of imaginations, the possibility that one could immunize a child with uh, pandas with a vaccine like this and have it prevent further streptococcal infection. So this would be a wonderful ideal. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of work that's gone into this in many centers around the world for many years, and there have been a great deal of difficulty actually making a vaccine that would work. But due to the work of a number of investigators, most prominently in this regard, uh, um, an investigator at the University of Tennessee, Memphis, named James Dale, um, it has been worked out that you can take some of these so-called M proteins. There's many, many types of uh, group A strep in terms of their M protein types, but we know that antibodies to M proteins protect. And, if, and so those have been the, the um, object of vaccine development is to develop a polyvalent, meaning multiple M types, all put together into one vaccine to take care of at least the most common strains of uh, group A streptococcus. And this has been very promising. That has been developed to the point where a cluster uh, in two different uh, type of vaccines, uh, one uh, that has uh, is 30 valent against 42 of these uh, genetic types, another that's got 30 valent against 26 M types, and if you, these vaccines could be successful, it would pot potentially prevent 95 percent of group A streptococcal infections. Pretty exciting. Um, there are other um, uh, ways of approaching that, but before I leave the subject of M proteins, I have to say that um, this vaccine now has gotten into a, a clinical trial level. And interestingly enough, the clinical trials that are now starting to take place are taking place right here in Canada. Um, and uh, one of the people who is uh, prominent, if not directing the actual uh, uh, vaccine trials, is right here in the room, uh, Dr. Uh, 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 Miller? Martin. Martin, I'm sorry. <laughs> Dr. Luis Martin is here. He's the, uh, one of the executive officers that's helping set up these studies. And in about a year's time, he tells me, we may actually have some data in adults, at least, as to whether uh, the vaccine that they've proposed will make uh, antibodies in the serum that will kill um, streptococci. And if that works, then the hope is the next step that we can actually show it would prevent infection in, in human beings and ultimately in children. So the, we're, that is underway. And in the next year years to come, we're going to become, hopefully, we'll get closer and closer to having this vaccine. I'm very pleased to be able to say that. There are other uh, routes of trying to do this with carbohydrate antigens and non-M protein antigens that have also been under investigation. And these, too, offer some hope. Uh, one of the concerns are always when developing a strep vaccine is that our is that it is a possibility that the antibody to the vaccine may very well be cross-reactive mimicking antibody and that the vaccine antibody might actually induce some of these syndromes. Uh, so that's the great concern. So far, uh, the selection of the antigens for these vaccines is made with that in mind. And so as these studies go forward, uh, it has to be a careful look, I'm sure, to make sure that there are no autoantibodies that are being produced as a result of the immunization. And that's one of the things we'll find out as a result of these studies. Uh, even more exciting, but much further away, is the idea that one could develop a, what, what I'm calling a tolerogenic vaccine. And what that means is that, um, uh, see if I can explain this. Uh, normally, when you encounter a, a, an infection, call it strep, uh, the body wants to make antibodies to help get rid of this um, strep. 
and we've heard over and over again, and I'm sure you all understand this idea of molecular mimicry, that in the process of making strep antibodies, we may make a strep antibody that also happens to cross-react with the brain and cause our disease, or a number of different diseases, as uh, Tanya just pointed out. Um, but the host normally does this to a certain extent, just as a normal thing we all carry around some of these brain antibodies at some level. Um, but when that gets out of hand, the control, the tolerizing mechanisms uh, fail, and this gets out of hand, then these become pathologic and potentially can cause disease. So there already exists in, in humans and animal hosts a mechanism to damp down autoimmune responses so that they're there for other purposes, uh, but they, uh, they're kept down so that they don't produce disease. And as that fails in some people, then you have the risk of having these autoimmune diseases. So the approach then to try to make a, try to stimulate the process that damps these down. And it's very similar to the process that makes antibodies. So if you get a strep infection, your body will see it see it as foreign, make antibodies just like it's supposed to. And another part of the body is saying, okay, with this particular piece of strep, hang on, dampen this down. And so we're looking for a way to use that second mechanism and enhance it. Um, and this is where the work that's going on is uh, so exciting. So that the idea of inactivating an already existing antibody producing system. So we want to take these autoantibodies that are causing the trouble and somehow reverse the process by taking advantage of a natural process that's already there to, to do that. Um, and Dr. Zaguani, who happens to be uh, with us at the University of Missouri, has worked on this for about a dozen years. Um, and so the strategy for inactivating these autoreactive T cells, uh, those are just immune cells, is to present the antigen, identify what the bad antigen is, the mimicked antigen, identify what it is, and present it, quote unquote, in such a way that the host sees it as this looks like self and we'll make the tolerizing mechanism come into play. Um, and at the same time, it may be possible to s stimulate the T cells that downregulate. There's one system that makes you immune, this, uh, and then there's the so-called regulatory T cells that make you less immune to any given uh, antigen, like one of these bad strep antigens. Uh, so it's possible to also try to expand these downregulating cells at the same time. So at the one hand, the idea is to turn off the cells that are producing the bad antibodies and turn on the cells that downregulate. And these are specific to any one target, one target antigen, say a neural nervous system antigen. So what he did was he takes a, just an ordinary, he just makes a bunch of IgG molecules. And so the blue in this picture is an IgG molecule. And there are ways to genetically alter it to insert the antigen in question. Uh, so in this case, he may have taken, in his experiments, he did not do this with, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, pandas or sydenhams, but he did do it with multiple sclerosis model in mice and with a di juvenile diabetes model in mice, both of which have specific autoimmune targets. And so he takes this target, he calls it the self-peptide, um, and they, you can insert this genetically into the uh, IgG molecule. And if you put it into the IgG molecule, as marked here in red, and then use that molecule as a, as a vaccine, um, it does the following. So you can see, uh, do I have a pointer? You can see at the top where it says IgG self-peptide is that's the molecule in question. It's attaching to an antigen presenting cell. So the body has a system to capture these antigens as they come into your system, process them, chop them apart, and deliver them to the T path cells over on the right, the bad pathogenic cells. Um, and, and that will produce antibodies if these cofactors down at the bottom there with the X'd out circle, B7, CD28, the cofactors have to be, uh, co-stimulating factors have to be there as well. So in the normal system where you're making antibodies to something, these cells um, in, 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 uh, uh, pass messages to the pathological cells in two ways. One, here's the antigen, what it is, and two, that it's a bad antigen and you need to make antibodies to it. Um, but when the antigen is presented in this particular way, in the midst of an IgG molecule, the second part, the co-stimulatory part, is not activated. So that the, only the direct 
uh, identification of the antigen to the pathologic cells is given, and when that happens without the co-stimulation, that's just X'd out at the bottom, the cell just dies. So, so that the immune, bad immune cell on the right, the pathogenic T-path cell, sees, is presented the antigen in this way, it turns off the cell, and actually disappears, and the antibody levels go down, and these diabetes models and the uh, encephalitis models are reversed, and he's shown this in mice. At the same time, down at the bottom, uh, other cells, uh, this IL-10 mechanism is turned on, and that, with the regulatory cells, also interacts with the regulatory cells in a way to turn on the regulatory cells. So with this one tolerogenic vaccine, He's able in, the, in these mouse models to turn off autoantibodies and turn on specific downregulatory antibodies uh, and reverse, literally reverse juvenile diabetes in mice and reverse uh, autoimmune encephalitis in mice models. So this is at a point now where uh, the next steps are going to be to try to humanize this in some way and see if it can be made to treat these human diseases. And by extension, Dr. Zaguani tells me, um, there are, are at least reasons to believe the same process could potentially be done with, uh, with uh, 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 pandas. Uh, so that's a very exciting prospect. It may be 10 years away, but the idea is there, and uh, so we find that of great um, interest. That's just to say what I just said. <laughs>